Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles and open them to the book of Acts. Uh, We are in the book of Acts, studying through verse by verse, and we're going to finish our series today, this little sub-series in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47, that we've entitled, A Church That's Well. This will be part four of that series, and remember, we're using the word well, W-E-L-L, to help us remember four solid ingredients that help make a church strong, healthy, and vibrant. And if you memorize the word well, then you will remember them. We're using the word W for worship. A church that's healthy is a church, a worshiping church, an evangelistic church. The L, the first one is a learning church. And then finally, a loving church. Another way to remember them is just to memorize uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. As we learn of the early church, says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And even though last time we finished the acronym together, we finished the totality of our studies to cover that word, I really felt like the Lord had more for us, that we couldn't leave this section or this topic without this strong encouragement and exhortation surrounding our commitment your personal commitment to following Christ. Because here in Acts 2.42, this isn't just a representation of how the 3,000, you know, now the church is about 3,120. This isn't a representation like this was the next thing they did, although it was. From the original language from the Greek, the tense of the words here speaks of an ongoing decision all the way through to the end of the book of Acts, all the way through into our lives. So this is meant for us. It's not just like, oh, they got baptized yesterday and now this is what they did the next day. No, it's what they did the next day, the next day, the next day, all into we come today and we too are following this commitment to follow. So if you have it already, we've mentioned before the phrase continued steadfastly. If you haven't already, circle it. And next to it, you should write the word habit. This is their spiritual habit. This is what developed in the born again believer. This is the change that took place in their life. This was added to them. Now their new commitment, they had a brand new, fresh commitment, spiritual habit to these four things and more. This is what makes up the new life of the believer. They were all in, you could say. Other words you can write next to it, besides spiritual habit, you could also write the word steadfast. And of course, that's already built into the English language, steadfast as they're they're moving forward, nothing's holding them back. Now, again, as we're looking at this, I don't want you to misunderstand like the early church was perfect, they never made any mistakes. You know as well as I do, when we get to Acts chapter 6, in the infancy of the church, they're already arguing, they're already upset with one another. It's not like they're perfect, they're definitely not. But the habit and the manner of their life was sure, steadfast, Completely devoted is another phrase you could use here. Completely devoted. This is what they devoted their time to. Or another way you could say they were wholly devoted. W-H-O-L-L-Y. The the completeness of their life. This is what makes up a believer's life. In very simple terms. Another phrase you could put next to it is fully committed. Fully committed. And I think in the day in which we live, these are attributes that need to be a part of our lives. You know, as churches proliferate and they are are increasing all the more, it seems like more and more churches are trying to make it much easier to follow Jesus than it really is. They're watering down the gospel, not mentioning repentance or sin, and just say, come on in, like, let's just gather a crowd and call it a church. But you see, following Jesus requires you to count a cost you got to count the cost, church. It's not as easy as you think it is. It, you may even be in a position where, you know, it's kind of easy. i got an easy life. Well, then God's calling you to a deeper level of commitment because there's always a cost with following Christ. 
it's probably not as easy as you think it is. And you can measure it in and out of this little section here. You can say, well, what am I devoted to? What am I committed to? If somebody was examining my life from the outside, what would they conclude as my spiritual habits, if I have spiritual habits at all? Well, what's the manner of my life? What describes me? Who is the priority in my life? Uh, let me show you what I mean. Would you turn over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 14 with me? Luke, chapter 14. I mean, it's all fun to, oh, we can memorize a word, you know, and we can think of it, oh, we're a worshiping church, we're an evangelistic church, we're a learning church, we're a loving church, and yes, that's us, and that's what we want, and it's fun, and it's good, but listen, listen, there's a cost in following Christ. It's not just memorizing a word, or even hiding a scripture in your heart from time to time. That there is a requirement in following Jesus. And while the world, while, while, you know, I guess you can use different phrases. Again, you know, the Western church, the American church. You, you can even use us. You know, we're trying to make it easier. We're, we as human beings just want to make it easier because it can be so challenging to follow Christ in a culture that is anti-Christ. You know, it, it's super hard and super challenging. Like, like we, could, we could look at that and say, oh, look what's happened. Look what's happened. But the reality is, is while the church at large is making it easier to follow Christ, Jesus makes it harder. When you listen to him, it is a radical departure from what we might think it is. And we need to be reminded of this. Before anyone joins the team here and staff, before anyone takes of the tithes and offerings, or what we call worship money here. When you give, when I give of my tithes and offerings, that is my worship money. I am worshiping God by obediently giving. Whenever anyone takes of the worship money here at the church as a salary to provide for the needs of their family, I ask them, I ask them, I look them in the eye and I say, have you counted the cost? And you wonder, where does that come from? Right here in Luke 14. Have you counted the cost? So here you are worshiping Jesus, and the question is, have you counted the cost? I mean, we all want to be the church in Acts. If I ask today, hey, do you guys want to reach the city? Yes. Do, do you think you're the church in Acts? Yes. Do you want to go forward? Let's just go for it. I mean, all of us would say yes. It wouldn't take nothing to raise our hands on any question I would ask along those sides. But here is the substance of that. Notice with me in verse 25, of Luke 15, and just listen, or Luke 14, I should say, listen, listen to Jesus. It says, a great multitudes went with him, and he turned around and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. It's challenging words. They're so challenging that I think we miss the forest for the trees. We'll see that again in our look at Revelation later on in the study, but we, we lose the, the substance of what Jesus is saying because then we stop right here and go, wait a minute, hate my mom, hate my dad, how could Jesus ever call me to do that? And we get all stuck on that and we argue about it and, and we, we're like, no, I could never do that, I would never do that. And, and you create something that Jesus isn't asking you to do. The idea of hatred here is not the kind of hatred that stirs up emotion and you just don't like and you don't want anything to do with. This is, a, this is an instruction of priority. How do we know that? Because he includes ourselves. Did you see that at the end? You shouldn't be debating about everyone else. You should be really focusing on the only thing you control and that's you and your own life. The issue isn't whether, how you relate to mom and dad and brother and sister. The real issue is, how do you relate to yourself? Are you willing to die to yourself? Isn't that the biggest problem? The biggest problem is not mom or dad. The biggest problem is me and my selfishness and my self-centeredness and me facing a challenge and then rearranging and redefining who God is so the challenge isn't there anymore. And I could just sidestep it. Christians are perfect. They, they, they are so good at making excuses instead of taking what the Bible says and obeying it. So, like, oh, you know, it doesn't really mean that. And so uh, let's just skip to the next verse. Well, the next verse isn't much better. 
It says here that whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, Jesus is like, everybody's saying, come be a disciple, be a disciple. And Jesus is going, look, if you don't do it right, you can't be my disciple. You can't. You can't do it your way. You, you can't take Christianity like we've seen today. And maybe you know, the Lord's speaking to someone right now. Like, you know, I kind of fit Christianity into my life. I got my career goal, I got this, I got this. And yeah, maybe I could fit it into my life. I can make it fit. I, I, yeah, I could give. I, I could definitely give a few dollars here and there. Of course, I guess I could participate that way. You know, I can tithe. I would never tithe, but I could give a few dollars. And I could give a little bit of my time, you know, because I could fit that in. If I rearrange this and rearrange this, maybe I could go to church, possibly, maybe, once a month. I could buy a Christian t-shirt. I mean, I'll be a little embarrassed, but I'll wear it anyway. And I'll buy a cross. I can do that. I'll get a really big Bible. And then, you know, I think I'll fit it in. Jesus is like, look, you, you're all on the, wrong, you're on the wrong page. Here's where it starts. It doesn't have anything to do with any of that. Here's where it starts. You want to follow Jesus? You need to have him as a priority in your life. He has to be first. So much so he has to be above you and everyone that you love the most. And, and if you have the right priority, listen, you won't, you won't mistreat your parents. You won't mistreat your kids. You won't, that, that's not, obviously God in human flesh is not asking you to mistreat anyone, hurt anyone, abuse anyone, abandon anyone. That's not what he's saying. We, we know that because he clarifies later on in verse 33. He clarifies, he says, likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all. That's the phrase, forsake all. You can circle that, go back up and circle the word hate and write arrow next to it. The idea is forsaking for priority. Forsaking for priority. In the, in the world of economics, they have a phrase for that. It's called opportunity cost. And what they mean by that is that if you do A, it's going to cost you B. That's the opportunity cost. If you choose A, then it's going to cost you B. You can't do both. There, there is a cost involved to, to do the best and to be the best and to work. Like you're going to pay a price. There is a cost. And so here's what Jesus says. Notice with me back in Luke 14, he says this. And after all the crowds are going, we want to follow you. We want to follow you. You go, you know what? I don't think you guys understand what it means to follow me. And then he describes it. He says, for which of you? intending, this is verse 28, which of you intending to build a tower doesn't sit down first and count the cost? That's where we get the phrase. You're sitting down, you're building a tower, whether he hasn't, he doesn't sit down first, count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he's laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. So use a common illustration. You know, we may not be building towers today, but, you know, build a house. This, this verse really came alive for the very first time when we started construction on this building. Because I had driven around, I'd been around here in, in Aurora long enough that I would drive around, I'd see partially finished churches. There was a partially finished church in town that I would take guests to, and i go, this is why we pray and prepare, because you don't want a church to be half built and just sit there empty for years. We want to have enough to start and finish. And I remember it was just such a big burden uh, that we were like, okay, let's do it. We can do it. We can do it. Even after all the cost overruns and change orders and unbelievable, you guys in construction, I don't know how you do it. So you get it. So you have it. Then he gives you another example. He says, what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he has to send a delegation and ask conditions of peace. And both of these illustrations make perfect sense, even if we're not involved in that industry. Like if you're going to build a house, you're going to build it to finish it. That's the whole goal. You're going to start, but you're also going to think with the end in mind. You're going to start and you're going, no, I'm starting to finish. And then if you're a king and you want to protect the kingdom, and you know somebody's coming to attack you. You're, you're going to think it through and go, man, I need to make sure that I've got the right resources going out there so that we don't lose this. We don't have to surrender. We don't have to hurt the people we're supposed to protect. So we're going to sit down and strategize. We're going to look forward. You know, those of you in the military, this is your world. So like, I'm going to sit down. We're going to do this right. We're not going to put people out in harm's way. What I start, I need to finish. And so Jesus says, you guys get it? He says, yes, we get it, Lord. And then he says in verse 33, so likewise. 
Your walk with the Lord, your relationship with Jesus is like the guy that's building a tower. He's thinking a lot of what it's going to take to finish. Your relationship with Jesus Christ, your discipleship, the, the word disciple means learner, you choosing to follow Christ, you wanting to obey him. It's like the king that's protecting his kingdom and the precious innocent people in his kingdom. If he's going to go to war, he's not going to do it haphazardly. He's going to think it through. He's going to count the cost. He's going to get all the calculator out. He's going, duh, 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 duh. this is, man, we, this is what it takes and this is what we got to do. So he says, just like those guys, if you don't forsake all that you have, you can't be a disciple. I want you to connect that thought now back to Acts chapter 2. It's not as easy as you think. It's filled with warfare and challenges. It's filled with decisions. It's filled with all sorts of things that are sent your way designed to make you want to quit, throw in the towel, compromise, and make Christianity something that it's not. It's interesting, right? Because I'm sure you've talked to them. I've talked to many people as we're sharing and talking about Christianity. The topic comes up. They'll, they'll come back with a, with a statement. Say, well, you know, I've tried Christianity. I've tried it. It didn't work for me. I'm like, no, nah, bro, that's not how it works. Like, you don't try Christianity. Dying to self, you don't try to do that. You either do or you don't. It's like, well, you know, I tried that. Now, you might have tried a form of Christianity. You might have tried some religious system. You might have tried some, some bill of goods that someone told you. But you don't try Christianity. You die to yourself. That's how it works. It's no longer your will, but it's God's will. It, it is, it, you, the Bible speaks of, in these terms, the Bible speaks that Jesus died and bought you with the price of his own blood. That means bought speaks of ownership. He owns you and me. That's born again. It's not, uh, you know, I raised a hand and I stood up and I prayed the prayer. So now I, no, he bought you. Your ownership of your life, your way, your direction ended there. Or you can't be a disciple. You can't make Christianity something else than what it is. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a person surrendered life to Christ, all of it. And of course, it's going to be painful. Of course, it's going to be challenging. Of course, there's going to be discouragement. Of course, there's going to be failure. Of course, we live in a fallen world. And the reward even for perfection with Jesus, right? He, the God in human flesh, the reward in his life for a living a perfect life of loving, caring, serving was crucifixion. So yeah, it's going to be difficult. Yes, it's going to be challenging. Jesus told us, you want to follow me? In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. There's more to this world than this world. Isn't that great news? There's more to this world than this world. I, should, I set you up for an amen, church. It's true. There's more to this world than this world. And we look to a new heaven and a new earth and to bring as many people with us as possible. Because we love him, he, because he first loved us. Which leads me to Revelation. Would you turn there with me? In Revelation. So it's a warning to us as we come to Revelation. Again, another book of the Bible or another section of the Bible where you lose the forest for the trees, you know? Revelation, prophecy. Yes, let's, be, let's get into prophecy and let's what, be people of prophecy and, and let's just look for the coming of the Lord. Prophecy, prophecy. Listen, I, I love prophecy. The Bible's filled with prophecy. I teach Revelation verse by verse. I teach Daniel verse by verse. I, I look at the signs of the times. I understand the days in which we live, but there is more to Revelation than prophecy. <laughs> Some of you are like, what? Yeah. Yeah, there's more to Revelation than prophecy. You get so caught up in prophecy that you start living in another world and forget you're living today. You don't count the cost. Because you have to remember in the beginning of Revelation, in its totality, you know what the book of Revelation is? It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's all about him. Not getting all the dates right, not looking at this, and what about this came to, hey, you know, we, I've taught Revelation for many years, I've been teaching prophecy for many years, and, and just saying, hey man, the Lord's coming back, I believe it. We're living in the last times, I believe it. 
And, and the thing is, is now here we are living in the last days, but what's our response? What's our response now that we see things happening on a global scale? What's our response now when we see one world currency? What's our response when we see it perfectly set up for the Antichrist? You know, many Christians are fighting. Oh, no, 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 we can't. We got to get this back. We can't do this. And like, what are you talking about? You think you can stop the prophetic word of God? This is how it is. We need to be a part of Father's business, bringing souls into the kingdom. If we're the generation that sees it all come down, then we better be busy about serving Jesus, man, <laughs> instead of fighting wars with fighting the wrong wars with the wrong weapons, wasting our time. So yeah, we're in prophecy. I love Revelation, but before we ever get to the prophecy part, we've got these little letters to deal with in chapter two and three. If you have a red letter Bible, you notice they're all in red letters, right? It's like, oh man, that means Jesus has a final word before the end of the age. And so what does he do? He writes these seven little notes, these little messages to seven different geographic churches. And each church has a, a message that, that he has, each specific gathering of believers. Like for example, we can just go through them very quickly. Chapter two, verse one, he writes to the church in Ephesus. And this is the church that left their first love. Remember that? They left their first love. And when you drop down to verse 8 in chapter 2, is the church in Smyrna. They're the suffering church. They suffer greatly. Then you drop down to verse 12, you have the church in the city of Pergamos. And, and they're the church that started to compromise. So they're the compromising church. Then you drop down to verse 18, you have the church in Thyatira. Their, their compromise was so bad, they became idolatrous. Imagine that. A church no longer worshiping Jesus, but rampant into idolatry. Then you jump over into chapter 3, verse 1. You have the church in Sardis. It doesn't get much better. This is known as the dead church. This is a church, you remember, that has a name that they're alive, but they're dead inside. And then we have the church of Philadelphia. Now, the interesting thing about all these churches is when a pastor usually teaches this, we're like, oh, we're the church of Philadelphia for sure. We're, we can't be any of those other ones. We're Philadelphia, man. We're the ones that are going to hang on. We're the last... I uh, maybe you are, maybe you're not. But the church in Philadelphia is the remnant. And then finally you have the church in verse 14 of chapter 3, the church of Laodicea. Nobody ever claims to be Laodicea, but they're all messed up. They're the lukewarm. Man, I wish you were hot or cold. And until so you read this, you can even read it selectively. Oh, I'm Philadelphia, I'm Philadelphia. I hope you are. But I think that there's a little bit of every church in us. Maybe one's more predominant than the other, but there's a lot of suffering in the room right now. It probably took you by surprise. You didn't really think that coming to faith in Christ would be so painful, so hard. You thought perhaps, and not even incorrectly, just you were so excited, so full of joy, you just thought maybe it might, things might be a little bit easier following Christ. And in some ways it is, right? In some ways it's not. Some of you are compromising. You call it Christianity, but... Like, totally, you don't need a pastor to tell you. You know you're compromising. You know you're dabbling. You know you're not fully committed. I mean, I mean, some of you, some of you in this church, you, you're all into some weird stuff, paganism, idolatry, stuff that you call Christianity, but it's really not that at all. Because, you, you know, you might have brought it in from a religious system or picked it up at work or whatever, read some book, and now that book captivated you more than the Bible. I mean, that, that happens. These are all these things that happen to us. Some of you in Philadelphia, studying on, studying on. That's great. I mean, lukewarm. I mean, that could describe so many at different times. But the attention I want to give today is to the church in Ephesus. And I want you to tie counting the cost, continuing steadfastly, and the church in Ephesus all together in your mind going forward in your Christian life. I want you to connect them. I want you to hold fast to them and not ever forget how they all intertwine. Because it is easy to come to Acts 2.42 and say, well, that's us, that's us, that's us. Possibly it is. But it's never going to be us if we're not continually counting the cost and we're not walking in love. And that's what happens with this church in Ephesus. Listen to what it says, verse 1. It says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, that you have tested those 
who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. You persevered, you have patience, you have labored for my namesake and you've not become weary. Pause there. That's the kind of note I want to receive from Jesus to tell you the truth. I'd like to hear that. I'd like to open up my email box and say, special message, urgent, Jesus. Well, what did he have to say? You know what, Ed? I'm looking at the church and look at what you're doing. You're, you're persevering. You're discerning. You're, there are many good things coming through your life. And you're like, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. But then there's that word in verse 4. And whenever you have this series of positive things, this is not the word you want to hear. Good, 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 good. Nevertheless. I'm like, oh. Because we don't use that word very much, it may not pop like it should, so let me help it pop. Let me change it for you. Good, 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 but. Mm, you want to pay attention when a person uses the word but. Because after everything they've just said, when they use the word but, they're about to tell you what they really mean. What they really want to get across. I mean, I think of many conversations over the years. I think of someone that might walk through the doors here, perhaps for you today, your first time here. You come up after service. Oh, Pastor Ed, you want to, uh, I like this about your church. I like this about your church. And you're just waiting. All right, you're waiting. But I don't like this, this, and this. I'm like, well, bro, it sounds like you might need to find another church because this is who we are. And you want to listen to yourself when you're speaking because whatever is after the but is what you really want to conclude with. And this is what Jesus really wants to conclude with. It's not that the things you said were untrue to begin with. This is all true for the church in Ephesus. They started out well. They have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We learn that in the book of Ephesians. This is about 30 or 40 years later, you know, give or take. So that this is a generation has grown up. It's a new generation. It's probably some of the old generation is still there. But this is a new generation and here they are receiving this note, and you got all these good things happening. You're discerning, you're persevering, but here's the thing. This is the summary, verse four. I have this against you. Same Jesus. I have this against you. You have left your first love. Circle that word left. It's not lose, it's left. They walked away. With all their activity and their business, that they aren't centered in the love of God like they started. They started well, they're not finishing well. And the one singular issue that was causing them to go off track was a departure from the love of God. Because that's how it started for all of us. Somehow, some way, you were awakened to the love of God for you in your life. How important you are, how precious you are, and how God has a plan and a purpose for your life that will require you to deal with your rebellion, your resistance, your sin. That's how it all started for us. You were either raised that way in your house, and you knew that as a very young age, or like folks like me, I had to go the hard way experience a lot of pain and heartache because of my sinful choices, and then repent and deal with the consequences the rest of my life. But I remember that moment in time where the love of God captivated me. Captivated me. It changed my life. And every mistake that I make thus far will be a departure from the love of God. And even in the culture today, haven't you noticed a departure from the love of God from much of the church? They've made the gospel something other than the love of God. Often in response to the difficulty of the world that we have been teaching you about for years. That you have learned about since you opened the Bible. That in the last days, perilous times will come. And when perilous times come, how will we respond? Will we respond in the agape? That's the Greek word, by the way, that describes the love of God. The agape love of God. The agape love of God. It's a, it's a word that describes God's love. And when it's translated into something you and I live out, you could, you could say it's a self-sacrificial love. Which what? Ties back to what Jesus said. You can't be my disciple unless you forsake all and follow me. It's impossible. If you don't die to yourself, then discipleship's not for you. 
It's not going to bear much fruit. You're, you're not going to abide in the love of God because you've left it. You've departed from it. And over a period of time, that simple love, that pure devotion becomes cold, stale, lifeless, and even religious. So that you're full of the motions, but you lack the emotion of connection to Christ. You have departed from where it all began. I've been reading in my devotions recently in Galatians, and I've been real, I'm doing it twice now. I finished already, but I'm going back and doing it again. And this phrase is just so powerful. And I'm going to paraphrase for you. Basically, what Paul's saying is like, like, guys, what is wrong with you? Do you really think that you can begin in the spirit and perfect yourself in the flesh? Do you really believe that? That you can start with God working in you, and then the longer you go, you're going to make it better your own, on your own? And that's really saying, what is wrong with you guys? What's wrong with us when we do that? Why do we walk away from the love of God? Why do we walk away from this first love? You notice the word first? First is a word of priority. Not your second love, not your third love. It's your first love. Jesus, your first love. Jesus, your love above yourself, above your mom, dad, brother, sister, son, daughter, first love. The first love that forsakes all and follows him. The first love, the love that seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Your first love, your first love. And often that is what we're guilty of individually and as a corporate church. We're, we've left our first love. And that's all the, other, all the other problem. I think that's why Ephesus is first. All these other problems flow from walking away from your first love. And if that's you, now or in the future, let's listen to how Jesus speaks to us to get out, to change. So what does he say in verse 5? He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Interesting. Interesting. Lampstand speaks of a, he used that phrase to describe the church. So he says, you know, your lampstand, you got a specific place. If you don't deal with this, I'm going to remove you from your place. Uh, don't misunderstand this. Like you, you lose your salvation and then you don't be a church. Like he just says, look, you have a place that that word place speaks of prominence. It speaks of privilege. It, it speaks of blessing. And he says, look, if you don't deal with this, I'm going to personally come and remove you from your place of prominence, privilege, and blessing. For how long, Lord? Until, it says, unless you repent. So it's not permanent, but you'll feel it. It'll get, things will get worse, <laughs> not better, until you deal with this issue in your life. But Ed, Ed, I want to continue steadfastly. Okay, count the cost. But Ed, Ed, I want to be the early church. We want to be there. We want to reach Aurora. We want to reach Colorado. We want to see more in these new days. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, count the cost and consider the love. Where are you? It's not a list you're going to sign up on after the service. We don't have online registration for this. This is you. This is you. And it's interesting because the very first thing he says to do is remember. So you know how we have that message of moving forward, forgetting those things that are behind, moving forward, and you got the little rear view. This is the time you can use the rear view mirror, and I want you to remember. He says, I want you to remember. Remember from where you have fallen. And so you tie that. Where do they fall from? Their first love. And where were we introduced to our first love? When we were born again. Remember when you were born again? Before you knew anything. Before you became Bible smart, religious smart, church smart, you just knew Jesus. You couldn't answer any questions, didn't know you. You'd tell somebody, what happened? I got saved. Well, do you know about the sovereignty of God? Like, dude, I don't know what you're talking about, but I love Jesus. Well, let me explain to you the sovereignty of God. All right, do I need to know that? You must, you know, I've changed my voice on purpose. You must know. And all these people, and you start reading the Bible, you start getting smart. Oh, it's Greek. Oh, it's Hebrew. Yes, it's great. Oh, Asia. They're like, oh, on and on and on. And now longer, instead of love and faith, now you're living on knowledge and pride. 
You really think you know more than God? You really think knowledge is going to get you where you need to go? He says, remember from where you were fallen. It made me think. It made me think. When I got saved and born again, we didn't even own a Bible. I didn't even have a Bible. Not in the house, not on me. And yet I knew that God loved me. I knew that he died for me. And I embarked on my life knowing that I am going to live my life for God. Even though I didn't even know what that meant. I just knew that I needed to do that in that moment. And then I started reading the Bible and then I started getting into apologetics and I started really feeding my mind and I had all these little course corrections because living for Christ in love just seems too simple. It just seems like, man, what do you mean love? Yeah, Jesus summed it up. It's, it's actually profoundly simple and profoundly demanding at the same time. Remember, Jesus summed it up. If somebody wanted him, tell me what's most important in the law. And the law is, the, you know, really the first five books of the Old Testament, right? The Torah. What's the insignificance? When Jesus laid it out, he says, you know, it's all summed up in this. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And even now, some of you are like, well, that's just simple, man. Let's just get on to the meat. Yeah, you know what the meat is? Go and do it. Just trust the Lord with your challenging situation. Trust him. Yeah, but had I trusted him yesterday, it hasn't gone away. No, but you were stronger yesterday. You were trusting him. You live him by faith. You were abiding in him. You were obedient. And he got you through yesterday. You don't think he's going to get you through today? Yeah, but my circumstances didn't change. Yeah, you're right. Your circumstances didn't change, but you did. One more day of faith. One more day of trust. One more day of self-denial and serving others, self-sacrifice, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Knowing that God is with us, we need to remember from where we are fallen. This is such a foundational, important truth. Remember the power of Jesus to save your life. Remember the power of Jesus to pull you out of the miry clay. Remember his faithfulness. Remember his care. Remember how many, how many sins, that all the temptation that he helped you to avoid. Like remember, the problem of leaving our first love is we have forgotten the goodness of God. Which leads us to number two. Number two, after we remember is much more challenging. And that's repent. Repent. When we're going to get in chapter 3 of Acts, we're going to go much deeper. I'm going to spend a whole Bible study explaining the theological significance of repentance. It's very important we understand that as it relates to salvation, as it relates to life. But we'll save that for another day. Let me just explain it on its most simple levels. It's the Greek word metanoia, and it means to change. When it refers to your particular life, and when it comes to sin, the word repent, that's translated in English, repent, means to change your mind and change your behavior. You have not repented if you haven't changed your mind and changed your behavior. You haven't repented. If you have said, I'm sorry, Lord, I'll never do it again, and you continue to do it again, that's not real repentance. It might be an emotional response, but I also did a deeper dive on this and a deeper study in our study through Corinthians to learn what godly sorrow and worldly sorrow really is. Because repentance involves emotion. It's sorrow. It's like I have sinned against a holy and a righteous God and most likely have sinned against other people that love me and I love them. And this is not how I want to live my life. I don't want to walk away from love. I don't want to depart from the beginning. I want to be in Christ, for Christ. I want to continue steadfastly. I want to count the cost. I want to return and come home. I will no longer live that way, repentance. It's not feeling bad. It's not just simply feeling bad. It's like, oh, you know, I feel bad. Kind of like, you know, the difference between feeling bad when you get caught. Your kid's like that. They're just like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Bro, you're just sorry because you got caught. It, well, you, the real sorry, the real sorrow will be you know what you did was wrong and you agree with mom and dad that it was wrong. 
right? Kids have to change their mind. They think their way is the right way. It happens a thousand times in the house. And what you're looking for in your kiddos, you know, you're not going to sit them down and go, okay, son, metanoia. No, your whole goal is just see it the way I do. Would you just trust me? Just trust me. No, 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 I know better. You're like five years old. You know nothing. No, I know better. I want you. You know, I saw a baby shark. You know, shark told me, oh, yeah, sharky, sharky, shark, whatever that song is. Five years old. They don't know. But even telling them that, you're, they're not going to get it. You're going to walk with them, right? That's what God does with us as a father. You come up to God like a five-year-old. I know what's best for me. And God says, no, trust me. This isn't just transactional where I do this and now I'm right. It's relational. I trust you, Father. You've been faithful. I remember your faithfulness. And I trust you because walking away from love, I mean, what, what, what's going to be better than the love of God? What's better than the love of God? What's better? What can wash away your sins? It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. And where did that come from but love? Of course, we began with, oh, you know, the blood of Jesus reminds us we were bought. But just change the tone of your voice a little bit. And you're like, man, you belong. You're not just bought, but you belong. You belong to the Lord. You're his prized possession. And you're going to go off and do your own thing? You're going to play act with Christianity? You're going to come to church and put on a show? You're going to go home and you're going to be one thing here. You're going to be one thing at work. You're going to be another. You don't even, can't even keep up with yourself. You're so many things. That's what you want with life? Oh yeah, you're born again. Okay. But you've left your first love. So he says, remember, repent. And then what does he say? He says, do the first works. And for the sake of our using the letter R, you can use the word repeat or return here. So remember, repent, return. It's time to get back to simplicity, church, is what I believe God is calling us. Certainly calling me in how complicated my life can get at times. I got family issues. I got church issues. I've got life issues. I got personal issues. It can be pretty complicating. So what does the Lord say to Ed? Get back to basics, Ed. Simplify. Come back to love. Yeah, but you don't understand, God, this. Uh, just come back to love. All right. Yeah, but I got these. To see. Yeah, just come back to love. Like, what do you think? Is it my church or your church? Oh, Lord, that's not nice. No, it's not nice. My family or your family? My problems or your problems? He's like, son, to you, daughter, trust me. How do churches, large gatherings, individually, how do we get off? We choose to leave our first love. And it's often small, imperceptible, but the longer you're on that path, the farther you go. What the world needs today is the agape love of God living in the children of God. We need to be cooperating with the Holy Spirit regularly, daily, habitually, like it says here. Don't overlook continuing steadfastly. Let that remind you to count the cost daily, repetitively, leading you to a place of settled peace in the love of God. The world needs the agape love of God through the church. Only the church can reveal that love in a practical way. The danger, and it's even hard to say this, but here's the danger. This is, to, this is something we've got to pay attention to. There are literally churches today functioning without Jesus Christ. And there are believers today functioning without Jesus Christ. All the behaviors, all the activities. Look, look, Jesus says you're persevering, you're, you're laboring. You're, yeah, but you've left your first love which means you've walked away from that simplicity of your relationship 
with Jesus. And maybe that's you, maybe listening on the radio or online, like here in the room, like God is, has your attention in this matter. You've been tracking and you're thinking, hey, that's me. Well, then good. Follow through with what Jesus instructs. Don't pretend to be the church in Philadelphia when you're actually the church in Ephesus. Pretending will get us nowhere. We need to be real. I was talking with a brother last night. We need to be real. The Bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We just need to be real, walking in truth, being honest with one another, being honest with God, and just let him do his work in us. Can you let him do his work in you and and be discouraged? Yes. The world's discouraging at times. Can can you be, can can you allow the Lord to work in you and be successful? Yes. Sometimes God blesses with great success. There's going to be ebb and flow of regular life, but let it be the ebb and flow from the love of God. That's where the spiritual eternal difference is made, is the love of God being transferred in you and through you. Because even in all the early church, all their weaknesses, they still were strong. They still were vibrant. You listen to a Bible study like this and you walk away, well, you know, I'll never be perfect. That, that's, that word hasn't even been used till right now. It's not a perfect life. None of us are perfect. That's just not even the point here. The point is, look, following Jesus requires. You got to be open. You can't have it on your terms. That, if that's your life, you know, you've been trying Christianity on your terms, then you have completely missed it up till now. So much of the Bible we read and we don't want to apply it to ourselves. You know, we'll go to Romans chapter 1 and go, oh, look, these guys, they're creating a God in their own image. Well, no, it's not just those guys. It's not just those guys. We, we, we find ways to get around the clear teaching of the Bible at our own detriment. Because it really is just simple. You read it and you do it. And the, the, the simplicity of that is even greater than that. It is abide in Christ and he abides in you. And all the resources of Jesus are now your resources. So he empowers you and strengthens you for the journey. For the journey. Remember repent. And we know repentance is important because he mentions it twice. And return. So come back now to Acts chapter 2 and just understand the fullness. You know, these guys in Acts 2, they don't have revelation yet. They don't know what, they, the church in Ephesus doesn't exist yet. They don't know anything. They're just gathering together. They don't know anything. They're just gathering together to worship Jesus. What are we supposed to do? I don't know. Let's sing. All right, let's sing. Let's read the Old Testament scriptures. The apostles are teaching. Well, let's listen. And they're responding to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that as they launch off into life, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Fear comes upon every soul. And then notice in verse 46, continuing daily with one accord. So so now we know continuing steadfastly is connected to daily. So you can measure it in a daily, which every day. What am I, what's my life like every day? So continue daily with one accord. So there was a sweetness of unity. That word one accord is a phrase for unity. They, they had a unity that was different than anywhere else. They came in the temple. They broke bread together. They went to each other's house. They ate flu, food together. And notice it says they were glad and had what? Simplicity of heart. And I know things get complex very fast. I know. Life is complex. But it's great to respond to a complex world with a simple faith in Jesus. It, it, things are not going to get less complex. They're going to get more, more challenging, more difficult. And they had a simplicity of heart. I know that many of you listening to me right now, you're just like, I want that. Well, it's yours by faith. It's already yours. Take it. Enjoy it. Yeah, but Ed, you don't, you don't, you don't understand. Like, my. Like the brother we had share a testimony this Wednesday. He's like, yeah, I made a strong decision because I was unequally yoked. So now I made a strong decision. I look at my bank account, it's minus 400. How simple was that? Well, you pray over that like this brother does and God sent somebody to buy a trailer for him and now he's not minus 400 anymore. It's like God just takes care of you. 
Say, don't worry about it, bro. Don't worry. Don't focus on the numbers. I'll take care of you. Don't focus on the difficult. I'll take care of you. Don't focus on, like, like simplicity is what I want in my life. That's what I'm praying for. And that's going to lead to what? Verse 47, praising God, having favor with people, and the Lord adding to the church daily, such as it being saved. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of you want to be a part of that. Just simple. Lord, use me. Change me from the inside out. The world's getting darker and harder. I'm getting all caught up in it. I'm worried. I'm anxious. I'm fretting. Been a troublemaker. But Lord, I just want a simple life. I want to be a peacemaker. I want my life to matter eternally. I want to be a good friend, good husband, good single. I want to be a good dad, good grandpa, good grandma. I I just want a simple life. And God is saying it's yours. It's yours by faith. Father, we pray as we sound, you know, wind down our thoughts on this and um, what you're trying to accomplish among us, I, wanting to discern your heart for us, God, and for us as a church. We all want to be the church in Philadelphia, but uh, how many of us are Ephesus or Pergamos or Thyatira or Laodicea? And you just want us to repent and humble ourselves before you. Not walk in pride and arrogance. Like, you know, the word says that uh, knowledge puffs up. And we, we, need to, we need to learn, God. You told us to learn. You told us to study. But why? For the gain of knowledge or the gain of love? So, Lord, we pray for your spirit to enlarge our hearts that we might find ourselves in a greater place of surrender, a greater place of commitment, and a greater place of paying the price to follow you, whatever that is. Some haven't counted the cost ever. Some haven't counted the cost lately. And so we just want to measure it up, Lord, and lay it before you. We want to measure it up and lay it before you. Let our priorities be adjusted so that we can participate in what you're doing. We want all that you have for us. We don't just want a little bit. As you're resetting and redoing and changing so much in our little church here, it's exciting but challenging at the same time. We want in these latter days to be used in greater ways, not less. So help us. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.